Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the First Church of Christ in Farmington, Connecticut. It is so good to be here with you today. And today is a special day at First Church in that it's Father's Day. And so we are have put together a video of the important men in our community. Men who are fathers, grandfathers, uncles, friends, and mentors who have been faithful witnesses of God's love and grace in our community and our lives. So I hope you'll enjoy this video that we are you're about to see and um, find in it inspiration for your life of discipleship. Happy Father's Day. You are always there to give me a hug or show me what I could do to do even better, no matter what. I definitely wouldn't be the same person I am today without you, that's for sure. Love you, Willa. I hope you enjoyed that video. We are so glad that you are with us here today. And if you just found us on Facebook and are worshiping with us for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you and say that we'd love to visit with you and have you here sometime when we are no longer physically distancing. And we are located at 75 Main Street in Farmington, Connecticut. We worship every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So I hope you'll come by and join us. These lovely flowers that we have here today are a wonderful gift and they were given by the son of Reverend Charles and Irene Kramer in love in their memory by their son. So thank you um, for your generosity. If you are a pledging member of this congregation, we'd like to encourage you to continue to pledge during this time of social distancing. You can do it in one of two ways. You can send a check via the mail and send it to 75 Main Street in Farmington, Connecticut, or you can go online to our webpage, which is firstchurch1652.org. Again, that is firstchurch1652.org, and we have a Give button, and you can follow that. I do want to alert you to a change that's going to be happening in our worship um, starting next Sunday, June 28th. For the past three months, we have been the beneficiaries of Ed Clark and Joan Pritchard's wonderful artistic and edit video editing skills. They are taking a much deserved summer break. So in that time while they are away, we are still having online worship. It will just come to you in a diff slightly different form in that we will be doing everything via Facebook Live. Now, if you don't have Facebook, don't worry. You don't need to have Facebook to, in order to get to our Facebook, the church's Facebook page, or to use that Facebook um, to watch us on Facebook Live. You will receive an email that it will give you an uh, icon to click on, and from that, you'll go right to our Facebook page and you will be able to find the worship that way. Don't worry, we will keep, send out um, emails and keep you posted and hopefully help you in that um, transition and that it will be smooth. In the meantime, I do also wanna extend a special thanks 
to Joan and Ed. Their artistic and editing abilities, um, we could not have done it without them. It's been such a blessing to all of us, and I thank you, and we all thank you. And while we can't really give Ed and Joan a standing ovation, and they can't hear the clapping, I want Ed and Joan to know that everyone out there is probably on their feet right now, clapping away, saying thank you, thank you, thank you. It has been a blessing for all of us. And now, let us tarry no longer and begin our worship. Let us worship God. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter six, verses one B through 11. Listen for the word of God. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Christ Jesus. So ends the reading of this word. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, especially all the youth and children watching today. I'm so glad that you are here with us. So this morning, we're gonna be talking about our baptism and when we are baptized, the questions that the pastor asks our parents and our godparents, and then later our answers when we are confirmed to those same questions. So one of those questions asks us if we will treat people with kindness and goodness. And we respond, we will with the help of God. So sometimes that can feel hard or sometimes it feels like, oh, we are being nice and good people, but there are still people that are getting treated really poorly, poorly out in the world. And we have to figure out how we as followers of Jesus, what we would do to help those people to make sure that they feel safe and love and included. So I wanted to share something that I have that is incredibly special to me. I only have one of the three gifts, but I'll tell you all about it. So when I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, and I was going to Eden Theological Seminary, not to be Pastor Miranda, but to work in churches and help them um, figure out ways to connect to communities, my friend Brad and I were working at a place, the African Refugee and Immigrant Service. And one of the things that we ended up doing was to go to this family's home and help tutor them. They were a family from Somalia, which is a country in Africa, and they had been refugees, like our co-family. So they didn't look like a lot of other people in town. 
They didn't dress like a lot of other people. And this was shortly after 9-11, which none of you were alive for. But it was a time when people that looked like them were not being treated very well. And it was really scary for them. And here Brad and I were in their house. We're basically strangers. And yet we keep coming to help tutor her children. And one day, Khadija insists on giving Brad and I gifts. And this was not something that we were asking for or expecting. It's a gift. And she pulls out this beautiful, this is the skirt. This beautiful skirt. You can't touch it, but I bet you can see it. It's, it's velvet. It's got glitter on it. We know how much I love glitter. And then it has this beautiful gold trim on the bottom. And it came with a matching top and then a beautiful black and gold lace head covering. This was one of the very few outfits Khadijah brought from Somalia. And she was trying to give it to me. And at first I said no because I felt very, very uncomfortable accepting a gift um, from her. And then I realized that it was something that she really wanted to give. And that's why it's one of my most treasured possessions now. And I found out later that Khadijah gave Brad and I gifts that day because we were some of the few people that were being kind to her and her family. A lot of people were calling them names, um, making it very hard for them to feel safe in school. And, you know, Brad and I were just doing what we enjoyed doing. We didn't expect to be thanked for it. Um, but this is one of my most treasured gifts because Every time I see it, every time I see the photo of myself in this outfit at a banquet with Khadijah, I remember this moment when I was able to show kindness and goodness and love to a family who wasn't feeling that from other people. And that is what I I had promised to do when I was confirmed and that's what my parents promised to teach me when they had me baptized and so it doesn't mean that we go out into the world expecting gifts for every time that we're kind but it is the most beautiful reminder I have of how our love can make other people feel so when you see people being treated poorly for the color of their skin or who they love or where they come from or the language they speak, remember that we, our families made promises first and then when we're old enough, we affirm, we say yes to those promises and those promises include showing God's love to other people even when it's hard, even when they are not like us at all. Because God's love is so big and so beautiful. It's there for everyone. And our jobs as people that believe in that love is to share it with other people, even when it's hard. And sometimes that love means that we have to do scary things. And sometimes that love means we have to do hard things. So, all the time that love shows that we are braver and stronger and have more faith than anything mean and ugly and hurtful. So the next time you can, do what you can and do what you feel is good to make other people feel God's love. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, 
thank you so much for all the ways that we are able to express goodness and kindness and love to others. Help us to continue to find ways to connect with others that are different from us and to do hard things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be worthy unto you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. For my entire career in ministry, I have assisted senior pastors in confirmation or baptism. And we take turns asking questions. And so I always get the same two questions. And early on in my career, one of those questions were a qu was a question I felt very uncomfortable with. So let me read them both to you. Will you encourage Miranda to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, 
to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. And the response is, I will with the help of God. Early on in my career, I was very uncomfortable with that first question. Will you resist evil? I imagined evil associated with the devil, who was this little person with pitchfork and horns. And it felt very contrite and not part of my faith understanding. But as I grew not only in my ministry, but also in my faith, I realized that evil was so much more than this person with a pitchfork. That evil could show up um, in really tiny ways, ways that perhaps we don't even identify as evil. And then we often name it as unjust or cruel or hate. But nonetheless, it is rare that we actually call it evil. So I felt on these joyous occasions that it was really uncomfortable to use the word evil, to ask the people standing before us to resist systems of evil. But I have learned a lot. And in reading today's scripture, Paul tells us that when we are baptized, we die with Christ so that we may be resurrected into a new life. And for a long time, that was also a really uncomfortable thought. Here we are on baptism day talking about death. We're looking at this tiny infant most frequently and we're talking about dying. But what we're really talking about is renewal, resurrection, becoming part of a community, taking vows and promises and saying in this moment, at this time, and as my faith grows, I will work to dismantle systems of evil. I will work to call out evil. I will work to not cause harm to others. And this is one of my favorite questions. I love, do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. We are in a time and place in history where it is really uncomfortable to be white. It is. Because we are being asked to hold up a mirror to ourselves and take everything we've ever learned about the world and the way that people operate and systems and see what they really mean. Look at our own biases, relearn history, listen to other people. Now, why is that really hard and uncomfortable? Because I don't know about you, but I really like being right all the time. But when we're baptized and we acknowledge that we are dying to our old selves to be renewed and resurrected into this new community, following in the words and deeds of Christ, that means that we have to hold a mirror up to ourselves over and over and over and over again because our faith isn't about being comfortable 
It isn't about showing up online Sunday mornings or when we could worship together in the meeting house and saying, this is good enough. Jesus didn't just hang out in the temple and pray and say, this is good enough. He was out with people. He was listening to their stories. He was helping them reclaim their value and worth. He was healing them not only physically, but mentally through words and, and holding people and saying to them, I see you, I hear you, I believe you. Our baptism vows and even our confirmation vows may seem like they are eons ago. But we are asked to remember them quite frequently, not just in lectionary, but every time we baptize someone else or every time we witness a confirmation. We are to remind ourselves of those vows that we took. The vow that says, Will you encourage this person to renounce the powers of evil? We are saying, we will with the help of God. We promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. And we say, we will, with the help of God. If I said Black Lives Matter right now, some of you would probably feel very uncomfortable with that. Not because you don't believe that Black Lives Matter, but because you're conflicted. You support police. Maybe you have a family member that's in the police force and it feels like when we say Black Lives Matter, we're saying, well, then we have to hate the police. And that's not the case. When we say Black Lives Matter, what we are saying is, I renounce evil. I am showing love and ways to walk in justice and peace and love. And sometimes that means holding systems and people accountable for their actions. It's also means that sometimes we have to hold ourselves accountable. And we can say, well, I didn't learn that. And it's true. There's a lot of things, particularly about race, that we don't learn when we're white folks. But it's also true that it's 2020 and we have this wonderful thing called Google. And we can Google things like white privilege the history of race in America, stories of slavery, stories of the civil rights movement, of lynchings, even the history of jazz can tell us a lot about systems of evil and oppression. And when we learn to uncover those things, we feel very vulnerable, right? And vulnerable can be scary. And vulnerable means that sometimes we have to be like, hmm, I might have been wrong. But Paul in today's scripture reminds us that baptism means that we have died to our old selves. We have to look at things through the lens of following Christ. So when Christ looked out at the naked and the poor and the oppressed and said that you are worthy and you are valuable and I see you and I'm going to listen to your stories and I'm going to teach my followers how to also listen to your stories, it means that we have to figure out how to listen to stories and how to hear them. And it doesn't mean getting pitchforks and telling all cops that we hate them 
and that they're awful because that is not true. But it does mean that we have to challenge the systems that says to all of us implicitly and explicitly that the color of our skin deems our worthiness. When I have these very difficult conversations with people, sometimes my snarkiest phrase is, well, Jesus wasn't white. Not helpful. Not always helpful. Because snark, vitriol, righteousness doesn't help us uncover the possibilities in love doesn't help us uncover and understand our histories or where we come from or the stories of others. So as we remember our baptismal vows, we are being called in this moment to renounce evil to show kindness and mercy and justice, to walk in all ways that God has presented for us. And we don't do that alone. And there are people that have come before us that have showed us how to do this. I've talked before about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And as I leave us today, I want to remind you that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian who was from Germany, but he was teaching in the United States at a seminary when World War II happened, or started, and he began to hear of the atrocities happening against the Jews. And his friend said, we will keep you here and keep you safe. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, I am a Christian, I follow Christ, and Christ didn't stay where it was safe. And so he went back to Germany and he infiltrated the Nazis, became a spy for, um, I forgot the word, for the not Nazis, <laughs> the allies. And he helped to save many Jews lives. And as a result, he was imprisoned and lost his own life at the hands of the Nazis. But over and over and over again, he said things like, we are not simply to bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheels itself. We must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or omit to do and more in the light of what they suffer. Action springs not from the thought, but from the readiness of responsibility. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray no matter how much trouble he causes me. We are the spokes. We are not called to blindly judge people, to stand on the sidelines, to be silent, to let our brown and brown black brothers and sisters carry the burden. We are called to resist systems of oppression, to renounce evil. To accept our new life in Christ and die to old ways. To show love and justice and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ. And for some of us, that means listening and reading and learning. For all of us, it means putting away the assumptions that we've had for most of our lives. 
And more importantly, it is for us as people of faith, of a community of Christ that claims to be the body of Christ in the world, to figure out how we are going to make sure that we use our voices to dismantle systems of evil in this world, to be the love in this world. Because the world needs a lot of love. And God's love fills us up every day. God's grace and mercy abounds. So we do not have to be hard on ourselves for not knowing things or for not speaking up in the past. We just have to say, today I am remembering my baptism. I am dying to the old stuff. I'm going to be renewed and resurrected into this new life of love and and wholeness. And I'm going to do what I can to make sure that others feel that same love. We can do this. Glennon Doyle always says we can do hard things together. And we can. And we don't do it alone. We do it with God's love. Amen. And now, go into your day, your week, maybe a little out in the world, 
maybe with your family, but always remembering your baptism and being thankful. Remember that you are a child of God and you will always be a child of God. And may that be a reminder to you to walk in all the ways of Christ, to be held by the Holy Spirit, and to do hard things as we promised in the affirmation of our baptism. Go knowing that we do these things not alone, but together.